Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you once again to this uh, midweek video. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here on our YouTube channel as a way of staying current with the ministry when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an all-tech site. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, so if you're in all-tech sites, you'd like an alternative to YouTube, please check us out here on Rumble as well. My featured book in this video is my small booklet, The Preservation of God's Word, A Close Look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7. This is designed to be, uh, you know, passed out to people. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a long book or a large book, but it deals with an important issue related to Psalm 12, 6, and 7 and how that verse is used in debates regarding text and translation. I believe the verse is supporting the preservation of Scripture, but I have a slightly different take on it maybe than some. So if you're wanting to uh, get to the bottom of that issue, please consider picking up a copy of that booklet. So those of you that have been following the channel this week, <clears throat> I'm recording this Monday morning. It's going to be released on Friday morning, February 9. Uh, you know that we've been dealing with the Apocrypha. You know that um, David Preston has responded in a vi in video form to my short essay here, The Apocrypha in the King James Bible. And we've been kind of uh, reviewing his video that he released earlier this year, which is this video right here, The Apocrypha in the King James Bible. So this is video number five. I was originally planning to only do four videos, but there was a topic related to this that just wasn't really sitting right with me, and I felt like I needed to do some more digging and try to get to the bottom of it. And it's related to Coverdale, um, the 1539 Bible, uh, the great Bible that uses the term hagiographa on its title page and in its uh, preface to the uh, apocryphal section, and what all that means and uh, how Coverdale relates to all that and some of the things that were said uh, by David Preston in this video. So I've done some more digging around, done a little bit more research, and there's a few more things that I would kind of like to say about this particular topic, that being Coverdale, his view of the Apocrypha, and the, the Hagiographa there uh, on the title page to the 1540. This is a 1540 edition of the Great Bible. Uh, I'll have more to say about this shortly. Before I say anything else, I want to jump into the video. We're going to jump in at about the um, 17 minute, 35 second mark where David Preston begins talking about the hagiographa. And we're going to remind ourselves about what he said. I'll pause it a few places, interject a couple things. And then when we're done reminding ourselves, uh, I'll have a few more things to share. So here we go. About the 17 minute, 35, 30 second mark here as he begins to talk about um, the 1539 Great Bible. One of the biggest ones that I think is interesting. And uh, in fact, no, let me add one more. Uh, he, he goes on and he, he brings up the Great Bible of 1539. And that's one that I was like really shocked that he, he brought up. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that real quick. I actually have a slide to, to uh, show you that's related to the Great Bible. And, and here's the very interesting thing is that Miles Coverdale Miles Miles Coverdale. Let me go back to the title page uh, to, uh, to the uh, table of contents page for the uh, apocrypha. Uh, so the the Great Bible was the first, you would say, authorized English Bible. And the reason I say that is because it was the first English Bible that was sponsored by the Crown. And Archbishop of Canterbury Thomas Cranmer, he was the one that oversaw it, but he gave <laughs> the uh, responsibility to Miles Coverdale to ultimately oversee it. So just a, 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 a brief point there. So the Archbishop of Canterbury is the main overseer of the project. Coverdale is doing this work largely in France, if my memory is not mistaken. And so he is very much um, subordinate, if you will, Coverdale, that is, to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Okay, So it's difficult to say who is responsible for making some of these formatting choices. It's very clear that in the 1539 Bible, the apocryphal books were following the precedent of Luther, Coverdale's 1535, the Matthews Bible from 1537, in extracting the apocryphal books from the rest of the canonical Old Testament 
and putting them in their own section between the testaments. Okay. It's very clear that that's what they were doing. The issue is they're not called that they're not using the word in, in the uh, fifth in the great Bible um, apocrypha. They're using the word hagiographa. Now, before he goes any further, I just want to point out um, just sort of a technicality here because I do think it's important for us to have clarity on this issue. This title page here is from, it's the same title page I have here, and this is from a 1540 edition. The original 1539, the title page looked like this. It had the same artwork that was on the title page in the front to the Great Bible, but the stuff in the box in the center was different, and we can see here that, again, it used the word hagiographa, not apocrypha, all right? Now, in my first video, video number one, when I was talking about this before, I was a little bit thrown off because of the Oxford English Dictionary, okay? So here is the entry for the Oxford English Dictionary. Here's the adjective noun form, okay? Um, so let's look at the noun form. A writing or statement of doubtful authorship or authenticity, especially those books included in the Septuagint and Vulgate versions of the Old Testament, which were not originally written in the Hebrew and not counted genuine by the Jews, and which at the Reformation were excluded from the sacred canon by the Protestant party as having no well-grounded claim to inspired authorship. And then notice the word usage example that the OED gives. They give the 1539 the other books following, which are called Apocrypha, and then it says Great Bible Apocrypha Preface. So I was a little bit thrown off by that. Why would the Oxford English Dictionary have Apocrypha here from the 1539 Great Bible as an example when the artwork is, when it says Hagiographa, all right? So I was a little bit thrown off on that, and I now sort of am come to the conclusion that the OED is wrong here on this case. I don't think that, I think the OED potentially has gotten this wrong by saying apocrypha here because the evidence suggests uh, also from the historical catalog, which we'll get to a little bit longer, a, a little bit later in this video, that it did say hagiographa, not apocrypha. So I don't know why the OED um, included this here as a word use as example when the 1539 Great Bible says Hagiographa instead of Apocrypha, okay? So that's one thing that I needed to uh, address in this video, okay? Now, there's more to say, but let's go back in and listen to more of what David Preston says. All right, so this was just a couple years after Miles Coverdell published his Bible, and he was given the authority to oversee the Great Bible. And the Great Bible, uh, when we get to the section of the Apocrypha, it actually doesn't... Again, Coverdale is working with the Archbishop. The catalog is very clear. The first edition, so here we have 1539. Here's the entry of the Great Bible, printed with privilege by um, Grafton and Whitchurch. The first edition of the Great Bible, the Holy Bible of largest volume, which Thomas Cromwell, he was responsible for the first one, <clears throat> Thomas Cromwell, as the King's Vice Regent, <clears throat> in an injunction to the clergy, September... 1538 ordered to be set up okay notice what it says a revision of matthew's bible which he corrected chiefly by the aid of sebastian of luther and the vulgate and it is very much going to be overseen by by the archbishop okay so coverdale is subordinate in this case to thomas cromwell in the setting up and carrying forth of a revision of the matthew's bible coverdale's involved but he's basically subordinate to um, Thomas Cromwell at the time. Let's say Apocrypha. It says something that's very interesting. It gives a very beautiful, I think, uh, convincing word, and it's Hagiographa. Now, Hagiographa, as you see, the volume of the books called Hagiographa, and it lists the, um, not all the Apocrypha books because some of the Apocrypha books actually were put in the Old Testament. But let's just keep it simple. Uh, this is talking about the Apocrypha. And instead of saying the very word Apocrypha, which was used a couple years before in Miles Coverdale's Bible, the word Hagiographa is used. Now, the word literally means... Li also used, as we said in video number one, also used by Luther and the Matthews Bible from 1537, Apocrypha. Literally means Holy Scripture, Hagia, Holy, Grapha, Scripture. And when you look at your Bible, your English Bible, and you look at the underlying Greek word 
for the for the English word scripture, you'll see that that word in Greek is graphis. So there's there it's it's simply clear. It's right there. Now, what I tell people that right here that this table of contents is saying that the apocrypha is holy scripture. No, because technically, if I'm going to be consistent and this this is the right thing to do, the next page doesn't support that. OK, it doesn't support it, even though I think it's very interesting that the very word means holy scripture. But the next page gives us really good insight into the word hagiographa and also gives us insight into the word apocrypha. OK, now the word apocrypha simply just means hidden. OK, the word uh, the Greek word is used in Ephesians 3, 9, where it says hidden God. OK, so we've dealt with uh, those issues there in earlier videos. I'm not going to comment further. OK, so the word itself, it doesn't mean spurious. Today, I understand in today's vernacular, most people, when they hear the word apocrypha, they're thinking spurious. They're thinking um, not scripture. But the word that I, the word apocrypha literally means just hidden. And I believe when Miles Coverdell was using, I believe when the 1611 translators were, were, were using it, they weren't using it as saying this is, this is spurious. They were just saying that this is, this is a uh, hagiographia. And, and, and I'll explain to you what that means in the next page, that this is read in secret, that this is, um, um, this is, this is, this is like the hidden writings. Okay. That's it. That's all. To go beyond that and then to add spurious is not what they intended it to be. To be. Again, we've dealt with this issue. We looked at sermons from the translators. We looked at the uh, Anglican article, 39 articles, and the Elizabethan settlement. Um, and so we've seen that. Uh, we looked at the writings of James himself. So we've seen that, yeah, they did intend to identify the Apocrypha as less than, not authoritative, not canonical, etc be uh um uh, uh how do you say defined as okay so let's read this or let me read this because this is actually pretty hard to read i get it but i'm going to do my best to uh read this clearly without uh any any trouble but it's i'm going to do my so i'm going to follow along with my cursor here so you can see exactly what parts of this david preston is reading my best so here we go Whoop, i see a little camera all right so here we go this is the just like in Miles Coverdell's 1535 edition, this is uh, the this is the the uh, the translators to the reader for the uh, Great Bible, okay. And, and this is following the table of contents page for the Apocrypha, and this is what it says to the to the reader: In consideration that the books before are found in the Hebrew tongue, uh, received of all men. Uh, and that the other following, which are called hagiographa, so makes it very clear that the books prior, those are found in the Hebrew canon. But those that are called hagiographa, and this is, and it says, because why does it say why does it call them hagiographa? It says because they were uh, none to be read, uh, not openly or in common, but as it were in secret and apart. OK, and, and by the way, go get the go, you can you can go on archive.org, look up the great Bible, flip over to the page of where I'm showing you. Just go in the middle, check out the Apocrypha. It's somewhere around the middle it's, or it would be actually I don't know what page it would be. Sorry, but it's somewhere around the, the past the middle. Go to the Apocrypha and you can see this for yourself or the Hagiographa. And specifically, that's what I want you to understand is that Hagiographa, the Apocrypha does not mean spurious okay and in fact when you keep reading the translators to the readers for the great bible you will see that again just like miles coverdale it's not uh it is not casting doubt upon the apocrypha on the hagiographa in fact it is uh proving its point why it should be in uh the the, the bible and the scriptures and or to be specific, why it should be in the Bible, excuse me, and why it should remain there. Not in any way trying to cast doubt uh, to the reader or to even imply that they're spurious and that they, they are uh, that that they shouldn't be uh, included. OK, so please uh, take note of that. You can you can. So he says that that it's in no way cast out. So let's first of all, let's go back and look at it ourselves. So here is my copy. 
And the first thing that I want you to note is where he stopped reading. He stopped reading right here, okay? To the reader, in consideration that, uh, that the books before are found in the Hebrew tongue. So that would be the canonical Old Testament in the Great Bible, Genesis through Malachi, received of all men, and that the others following, which are called hagiographa, okay? So that would be these apocryphal books, because they were wont to be read, not openly and in common, but as it were in secret and apart. That's where he stopped reading. And so now he's, he's building a definition based upon only part of what it says, okay? And neither found in the Hebrew nor in the Chaldee in which tongues they, they have not of long been written, okay? So the reason why he's calling it uh, the reason he says that they're uh, read not openly in common is he's saying they're of doubtful authenticity, okay? Later on in this same section, um, so this is a little bit hard to read, so I have to kind of, um, um, where did it go? Just a moment, please. All right, it's right here, okay? And that they also were not received nor taken as legitimate. So they're not received and taken as legitimate. So this is this is saying that these books are of lesser authority, okay? And then if you drop down right here, St. Jerome, speaking of the truth of Judith, right here, Hagiographa, he saith, that men, it's talking about Jerome, that men may read them to the edifying of the people, but not to confirm not to confirm and strengthen the doctrine of the church. So this is very similar to what we've seen in, pre in previous videos, where even in the 39 articles of the Anglican church, they're to be read for manner and custom, but they're not to be, uh, no doctrine is to be based upon them. So what is throwing people off here, I think, with this. So let me just back up. So this is completely consistent with the views of the Protestants of the era regarding the status of the apocryphal books. OK, that they're not to be received as legitimate, that men may read them to the edifying of the people, but that but uh, not to confirm and strengthen the doctrine of the church. So they're not for doctrine and they are of lesser authority. This even though it's using the term hagiographa here, it, it is definitely saying that they, these are not on the same par with the rest of the canonical Old Testament. OK, now, again, what's what's a little bit confusing is why is the word hagiographa being used here? instead of the word apocrypha. And that's, I think, causing some confusion. Now, first of all, we need to look at the definition of hagiographa, all right? So here we have 1538. This is the lexicons of early modern English. The word hagiographa does mean holy scripture, 1542, holy scripture, 1552, the um, agiographa or hagiographa, okay? Um, holy scripture. So we can see that the, that is, that is, that word is related to the idea of Holy Scripture. But then we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, where did that word come from? And why is it being used in the 1539 Great Bible? Okay, as we saw right here, okay. Why is that word being used? What else can we determine uh, regarding that word? So let's jump in back into the Oxford English Dictionary even though it did sort of let us down a little bit on that issue of uh, Apocrypha. And let's type in Hagiographa. And here we go. Come on. All right. And notice, notice how this defines this. All right. So Hagiographa. Let's turn on all the quotes so we can uh, see everything that's available to be seen in case we need to. So notice what it says. The third of the three canonical divisions of the Holy Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, excuse me, the books contained in this division, see note, Kethuvim. So this is a word that is developed to denote the same, he, the, to, to mean the same thing as the Hebrew word, the Kethuvim, okay? Formerly also known generally as sacred writings. The two other divisions of the Hebrew, Hebrew scripture are the law and the prophets. The Hagiographa contains the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Canticles, Ruth, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, 
and Chronicles. So hagiographa is a word that denotes the third division of the Hebrew scriptures, okay? The first being the law, the second being the prophets, and the third being maybe uh, what otherwise might be known as the writings, okay? Or the kethuvim in Hebrew. So this is a word that is be, that is used to designate clearly a portion of the canonical Hebrew um, scripture. So why would that word be used in reference to the Apocrypha? That is sort of still the question on the table. Okay, we can also look at the Lex. We can also look at the Middle English Dictionary, and here's the earlier spelling. And notice what it says: A, the Hagiographa of Hebrew Scripture comprising Psalms, Proverbs, Daniel, etc. So that would be the same contents that we see back here in the um, Oxford English Dictionary is concerned, considered hagiographa. And then there's a general meaning that just means Holy Scripture. So the word hagiographa can be a general thing to just denote Holy Scripture, or it can be specific to a, spe a certain part of the Hebrew Old Testament, what the Jews would refer to as the kethuvim, okay, or the writings, all right? And it is very clear if we go to the historical diction, this the historical catalog of Bibles. So here's the 1539 entry. We've already read this part about the connection between um, Cromwell and um, Coverdale. But if we scroll down where it lists the description and the details, notice it says the volume of the books called Hagiographa. So that would be this right here, the volume of the books called Hagiographa. All right. The third part of Esdras and the second of Maccabees on the verso, so it'd be on the other side, the verse of the page, a note on the Apocrypha. So notice how Apocrypha and Hagiographa are being used here, even in this catalog of printed English Bibles, they're being used here interchangeably, okay? So the word Hagiographa in its usage in a 1539 great Bible is unique to the way the word has been proven to be used historically. So here we see that as early as the 14, 1425, the word hagiographa is being used to denote a specific part of the Hebrew canon, okay? We could see early that it's also being used, it is also being used to refer to Holy Scripture. So this is where things get confused. The word hagiographa as a word that is used to designate the um, third section of the Hebrew scriptures or the Kethavim or the writings is coined by Jerome. Jerome is the same one that is discussed in the preface to the uh, 1539 Great Bible as saying that these books are not, to, are, they're not received or taken as legitimate. That would be the apocryphal books. And um, they're fine that men re read for the edifying of the people, but they're not to confirm or strengthen any doctrine of the church. So Jerome is the one who comes up with this terminology. So although as Jerome, so we're reading here from a piece, an essay called The Apocrypha in Early Modern English. Notice what it says, okay? Uh, although as Jerome acknowledged, some reckon there were 24 books corresponding to the 24 elders of Revelation 4.4, this discrepancy mattered less than the tripartite division of the Hebrew Bible that he adopted. Namely, the Pentateuch, that would be the law, the prophets, notice, and the Hagiographa, five, eight, and nine books, respectively. So the term Hagiographa is first used by Jerome to refer to the canonical Old Testament books, okay, that we see right here listed out, right? So what are they? The Psalms, the Proverbs, Job's Cant Job, Canticles, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra through Nehemiah, and Chronicles. The Hagiographa is a term that is used by Jerome to refer to what the Hebrews would refer to as the Kethuvim. But for some reason now, the word Hagiographa is used in the 1539 Great Bible section, title page, and to the reader for the apocryphal books. Okay, now we could go down and to the next occurrence of Hagiographa, and what can we see about this, okay? Um, so he's talking here about 1539. He's talking about the Great Bible because of its size. Um, we it, it was authorized. It was amended by Munster's, uh, Sebastian Munster's annotated Latin. 
uh, to correct the Old Testament. It also departed from the arrangement of the New Testament books in Matthew's Bible, thus, uh, thus abandoning Luther's in favor of the Vulgate sequence. Now watch, again, the Apocrypha was separated and preceded with a trans with a translation of all Olivetan's prologue. So that means that this prologue was not written by Coverdale. Coverdale is translating Olivetan's French. So this is not necessarily Coverdale's independent thought regarding this. It is a translation of Olivetan's French. Okay. The text was essentially the same. So it's essentially the same as Olivetan's prologue. The text was essentially the same with one significant difference. The word hagiographa was substituted for apocrypha and used and used synonymously rather as we would expect in Jerome's sense as signifying the third part of the Hebrew Bible. So there so the term in other words is being misused. It's the whole prologue itself is a translation of Olivetan's French. And the only difference is this use of the word hagiographa instead of the word apocrypha, okay? And it's a misuse. Notice what it says, was substituted for apocrypha and used synonymously rather than, as we would expect in Jerome's sense, as signifying the third part of the Hebrew Bible. So the third part of the Hebrew Bible, as the definitional meaning of hagiographa, checks out according to the Middle English Dictionary. It checks out according to the Oxford English Dictionary. All right. And then we can look also at um, Alistair McGrath's book. So we've looked at this in the beginning. Notice what he says in talking about the um, Great Bible. The new translation, which contained no offensive marginal notes, appeared in April 1539 from the presses of Richard Gaft Grafton and Edward Whitchurch and rapidly became the the favored bible for use in the churches in this in this bible that became known as the great bible it included both the canonical and apocryphal books mistakenly referring to the latter that would be the apocryphal books as the hagiographa so mcgrath and the author of this essay are saying that when the word hagiographa is used in the prologue here on the title page and in the prologue to the great bible that it is a misappropriated word, okay? The more accurate word here would be to use is apocrypha. And as far as I can tell, that checks out with all of the evidence that I can, uh, that I can look at and consider here regarding the history of the word, how the word was first used, Jerome's first meaning, what he meant when he talked about the hagiographa, the fact that in the prologue here is talking about Jerome's view of the apocryphal books again that they're not taken as legitimate and they're not to be they can be used for the edifying of the people but not to confirm and strengthen the doctrine of the church and you'll notice that um again i'll just point out that when david preston was reading this he stopped here and he therefore sort of used the pieces of this that he felt he needed to use to build an argument without necessarily taking into account the totality so I think the word hagiographa is a misappropriation. I'm not the only one that thinks this. McGrath thinks this. The author of this essay here on the Apocrypha in the early uh, early modern English Bible thinks this as well. And this is a chapter out of a larger work um, by uh, Hesseon. That's how I would say that. Um, hope that pronunciation is correct. And this whole essay is about are the apocryphal books to be owned as God's word? And the answer given is no. And then that this this entire essay is about, this entire chapter is about that issue. Okay. Now, in case there was any doubt about Coverdale's view, excuse me, what I've done is I wanted to get some sort of independent confirmation about Coverdale's view. Okay. Because in his video, David Preston seizes upon the 1535 prologue or translators to the reader um, wh where he mentions some issues related to um, uh, Coverdale saying he couldn't prove it was Apocrypha. And so therefore, David Preston takes the uh, position that, well, Coverdale didn't necessarily believe 
these were apocryphal books. Okay, so what we wanted, what I wanted to do is look for some independent confirmation in the writings of Miles Coverdale to see what he actually said about this. All right. So we're going to look here at the remains of Miles Coverdale, Bishop of Exeter, and this contains um, a bunch of stuff here related to the Bible. Stuff that, uh, pieces that Coverdale wrote during his life, okay, expositions that he made. And what we are going to be looking at here is the confutation of a, of a treatise or a treaty of John Standish. This is the piece that we're going to be looking at here. And we're going to go here to page 454. Hopefully this calls up quickly. And here we go. So this would be page 426 in the piece. So this is in an exchange with Standish here, and notice what Coverdale says, okay? They're discussing the idea of the saints in heaven praying for people here on earth, which is sort of a Catholic view, all right? To prove here that the saints pray for us in heaven, ye make a long disputation, and with the scriptures ye do as ye were wont. So he, he does how, he handles it however he wants. They have... They have love yet, ye say, and therefore they pray for us and are our advocates. I answer, the same places of Scripture ye bring in yourself are most against you, for they declare manifestly that it is the office of Christ to make intercession for us. So he's disagreeing with them about what certain passages teach, okay? Um, and that he is with the Father, our advocate, which obtaineth grace for our sins, the saints then that be in heaven, knowing knowing this eternal will of God, love us not, and they desire to and that they desire to be, neither can they be against it. Now notice what he says. It is a token that your doctrine hath but a weak foundation when ye go about to prove it by a dream, yea, out of and by a dream, yea, and that out of such a book as serveth not for the confirmation of doctrine in Christ's church. And what book is he referring to? He's referring to 2 Maccabees chapter 15. Okay, he's referring to 2 Maccabees chapter 15. And notice Coverdale's view. Okay, he says, let me read it again. It is a token that your doctrine hath a weak foundation when ye go about to prove it by a dream, yea, and out of such a book as serveth not for the confirmation of doctrine in Christ's church. And he's referring to Second Maccabees, verse chapter 15. For though it be read among the stories of other books, yet did not the church receive it among the canonical scriptures in St. Jerome's time. Folks, Coverdale did not believe that the Apocrypha was scripture and that one should be building doctrine on it. And he says as much in his confutation with, um, I forget the guy, Standish here, in this piece. Okay, Neither can ye prove that book lawful by any saying of Christ, for throughout all the New Testament he maketh mention of none but the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, and biddeth not search any other scripture, but such as bear record and testimony of him. So Miles Coverdale is very clear that you should not be, that these are not canonical, that 2 Maccabees is not canonical, that you should not be building doctrine upon it, and that Christ did not refer to it as a methodology of sustaining or building doctrine. The testimony of Coverdale is much clearer than what David Preston would want one to believe if you watched his video. Okay. So I just wanted to point that out as a point of fact. And then I want to end with some summary statements from the King James Version at 400, assessing its genius as a Bible translation and literary influence. There, I made reference to this earlier in one of my videos, but there is an essay in this work, and it is this one here by Andrew E. Hill, the King James Bible Apocrypha, when and why lost is the title of the essay, okay? Now, I'm going to be reading here from page 351, and there's some summary, some summative information here that I want to share before I end the video, okay? So I'm reading from the bottom of 351. 
He says, by way of summary, according to one source between 1632, when one of the early editions of the King James Bible without the Apocrypha appeared, and the decision of the British and Foreign Bible Societies in 1826 to withhold funding from Bible societies that produced Bibles with the Apocrypha. So by 1826, the British and Foreign Bible Society will not support any Bible society financially that is printing Bibles with the Apocrypha, okay? So let me read that, start that over again, all right? It's, um, withhold funding from Bible societies that produce Bibles with the Apocrypha. So this is between the years, again, 1632 and 1826, okay? 579 editions of the King James Bible were published in England. A total of 227 of those editions, or approximately 40%, were published without the Apocrypha, okay? These statistics would include, however, that these statistics would indicate, however, that despite the opposition of the Puritans and Presbyterians, there was still a strong presence of the Apocrypha in the King James Bible for about two centuries after its initial publication in 1611. Next paragraph, Harold Scanlon breaks down the percentages of non-apocryphal Bibles during the same time period more precisely, noting 14%, 15 of 110 editions of the King James Version and Geneva Bible published between 1611 and 1639 lacked Apocrypha. 65%, 48 editions of 73 editions of the Bibles published between 1639 and 1660 lacked the Apocrypha, and the percentage of non-Apocryphal Bibles published between 1660, which would be the restoration of the monarchy, and 1700, only dropped to 60%. Scanlon's statistic for non-Apocryphal books published from the period immediately subsequent to the publishing of the King James Bible is 62%. So within the first century of its publication, okay, 62% of the editions published are lacking the apocryphal books, okay? So let me read that again. Scanlon statistic for non-apocryphal Bibles published for the period immediately subsequent to the publishing of the King James Bible, 1611 to 1700 is 62%. That is exactly what I argued in the essay when I said that the apocrypha was left out over time and an argument that was sort of uh, not necessarily represented in my opinion accurately. Next paragraph. The increasing separation of the books of the Apocrypha from the Old and New Testaments in the publication of the King James Bible is mirrored in the, in the reduction of reading lessons from the Apocrypha in the Church of England lectionary across the same time period. So the Church of England lectionary is dropping Apocryphal readings throughout the same time period um, as we work our way through time. The reading of lessons the, re the reading lessons of the 1549 lectionary included 108 readings from the Apocrypha for 54 days of the church year, or 74% of the total chapters in the books of the Apocrypha. By contrast, the revised Church of England lectionary of 1871 included 42 readings for 21 days of the church year, or 22% of the total chapters in the books of the Apocrypha. The Irish Church removed all readings from the Apocrypha from its scripture lessons after becoming an independent church of independent of the Church of England in 1871. So as the liturgy drops apocryphal readings, there's a correlation to the number of printed editions that are no longer uh, carrying the apocryphal books. The British and Foreign Bible Society was founded in 1804. Um uh, talks about both groups strictly rejected Bibles with the Apocrypha. A majority of the society agreed that the books of the Apocrypha were not to be a part of the Holy Scriptures and should not be published in English Bibles. So essentially from its founding, the British and Foreign Bible Society did not issue English Scriptures with the Apocrypha. And then we could jump to page 355. Uh, um talking about the same policy. 
adopted a policy. So the British and Foreign Bible Society adopted a policy in 1826 and 1827 that forbade participation in the circulation of the Apocrypha and disavowed financial aid to any society engaging in the circulation of Bibles that included the Apocrypha. The American Bible Society followed the lead of the British and Foreign Bible Society and adopted a similar policy in 1828, which is why the vast majority of the American printings of the King James Bible do not contain the Apocrypha either. So since the British Foreign and Bible Society's decisions in 1826 and 1827 restricting the publication and distribution of Bibles containing the, the Apocrypha, most editions, reprintings of the King James Bible omitted the Apocrypha. Ross, not me, the author being cited, noted, by the end of the 19th century, it was unusual for the Apocrypha to be printed with any English Bibles except those intended for pulpit and lectern use. In summary, the Apocrypha were never were, were never entirely lost from the King James Bible during its nearly 400-year history, but the incidence of printing is extremely, they are, they are clearly dropped by from 62% of the Bibles during the time period under, under consideration before the standardization of the text in 1769. I showed you data regarding this also in a previous video. So what is my point? My point is that Coverdale did not view these books as books to build doctrine on, and he basically uh, scolds Standish for doing so, for basing something on 2 Maccabees 15. The, the print data is overwhelming. Secondly, the print data is overwhelming that the that the King James Bible was printed without the Apocrypha from very early in its history, and that it was left out over time. Eventually in the 19th century, both the British uh, and Foreign Bible Society and the American Bible Society refused for a time to even print Bibles containing the Apocrypha. So that means Apocryphal Bibles printed in those areas are going to have to come from different presses and different places uh, that are, that are uh, printing the Bible. So this is my sort of fifth and final video on this, at least for now. To, we'll see what happens. But we've looked at the Hagiographa and the appropriate use of that term. We've looked at the 1539 prologue in this. We've talked about Coverdale's view of the Apocrypha. And we've ended here with some statistical data that is drawn from the, the essay here of Andrew E. Hill um, in the compendium done by the uh, Society of, of Biblical Literature um, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the King James, the King James Version at 400. So again, we've covered a lot of ground in this video. I hope that it made it all made sense and that you can keep it all straight. But I felt like there were some things, uh, outstanding things that needed to be sort of covered and loose ends tied up. Thus, my decision to make video number five here. So if you're watching this, it's uh, Friday morning, February 9. This evening, there is a debate between Steve Christie and um, David Preston on the issue of the Apocrypha. I would encourage you to check that debate out, to watch it. Um, to see uh, what the two men have to say regarding this um, should be interesting to consider that in light of all the ground and material here that we've covered this week. So as always, let me end by saying, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never relied exclusively on his death for you on the cross, his shed blood as the only total complete payment for your sin and his resurrection on the from the third day, the victor over sin and death, Stop relying in your works, your performance, your ability, your law keeping. You can never make yourself just and righteous before, um, before Almighty God, but rely and trust exclusively on the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the price, did what was necessary to give you eternal life as a free gift. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.